Well, here we are. We are back in the Sermon on the Mount, and we're going to be continuing here on into Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 through 16, where Jesus is going to call his followers to be salt and light in a decaying and dark world. And what we're going to do today is we're going to learn what being salt and light entails. For example, the call to be light means that you and I are called to be different from the world, but not absent from the world. And so think of it this way, how is the world going to see the light if you and I become no different than the darkness? And how is the world going to see the light if you and I become like a bunch of monks and flee to a monastery? Where are they going to see it? And so, dear ones, we're going to be reminded again today of that exciting truth that we as believers in Jesus Christ do not wake up to an alarm clock, but a calling, a calling to be salt and light in our world. Now, dear ones, as we approach here, verses 11 through 12, I want to mention that there is a final beatitude, a ninth one that Jesus will use as a bridge between the eight beatitudes that we looked at last week and the call to be salt and light this week. And so that's where we pick it up here. Verses 11 through 12, Jesus says, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, dear ones, I want you to notice in blue the ultimate reason why you and I as believers are going to be persecuted, being spoken of in an evil way, being lied about, is not simply because you and I have chosen to be moral people, for the the world will often tolerate even a moral man or woman, but they won't tolerate the claims of Christ. And so I want you to see here that it's because we belong to Christ that we're going to be persecuted. Think of it this way. Remember in John 16, 8, when Jesus ascended, he sent the Spirit. And according to John 16, 8, the role of the Spirit is to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And you and I are the conduit of that Spirit Why we are indwelt by the Spirit and we use the Scriptures as our primary spiritual weapon, which was inspired by the Spirit. And so in a sense, God is using us, the Spirit is, to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and they don't like that. So they're going to persecute us just as they did Jesus during his earthly ministry. Yet Jesus says in verse 12, in fact, let me pull up my pointer. I want everyone to see this. It is an imperative in the Greek, we are to rejoice and be glad. Now, why can we rejoice and be glad even when we're persecuted? Well, notice he says in the underline, for your reward in heaven is great. Notice the promise is not that you and I are going to have our best life now. He is not promising us that you and I are going to be the power brokers of our age. But instead, what's being promised that our reward is going to be absolutely magnificent in heaven. Now, remember, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, just the last week that we were together, and in verse 10, we saw Jesus use that common refrain, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All believers in Jesus Christ are inheritors and possessors of the kingdom promises. And so when this reward comes is when Jesus Christ comes, he's going to first start a kingdom upon the earth for a thousand years called the millennial reign. After that, we're going to have the eternal states a new heavens, a new earth, a new Jerusalem, the cosmos will be your playground. And the Lord will be the Lord of all. Oh, what a day that will be. And so the persecution here and now is certainly worth it. Now, we're going to talk about that more later on in Matthew, but I want you to see here at the end of verse 12, he also links us in solidarity with the prophets, notice, who were persecuted long ago. And I don't want you to, you don't have to turn to it, but if you're a note taker, jot this passage down, 2 Chronicles 36, 16. I'm going to cite it, and it talks about how in the time when Zedekiah and the Israelites were in rebellion against God, how they didn't listen to the prophets either. So remember, Zedekiah, the king of Judah, is going to be led off into Babylonian captivity. The leadership of Israel, they were living in idolatry. The people of God, the vast majority, didn't believe, and they disobeyed. And so listen to what it says, and I'll relate that to the last days we're living in. 
2 Chronicles 36, 16, it says, but they continually mocked the messengers of God, despised his words and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people and there was no remedy. Brothers and sisters, I would submit to you that's the way it is in the last days. You and I are using the words of the prophets and apostles, and yet they're being scoffed at once again. The vast majority of the unregenerate in this world will scoff at our words. And yet, we are to keep preaching the word. We are called to be salt and light, as we're going to be seeing. Why? Because God is going to use us to convert the elect. There is a number that God has ordained, a people, that we will be used to bring them in to the glorious kingdom. And so, dear ones, you and I, therefore, are called to be salt. And that's Jesus' point now as we pick it up here in verse 13. He continues, he says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Dear ones, the first, one I want, first thing I want to point out here is notice in blue where he says, you are the salt of the earth. That's a declaration by Christ of what we are. But what precisely does Jesus mean by calling us salt? What's the point of the metaphor? Well, a few things I want you to keep in mind. First of all, in the ancient Near East, salt was considered an indispensable mineral without which life would be impossible. In fact, During the intertestamental period, the 400 years prior to the New Testament being written between the old and the new, it was very in vogue for writers to talk about indispensable minerals, and salt was often one of them. So the idea is that salt was so indispensable, life would be impossible without it. And in a true sense, if you and I were not in the world, where would people hear about the word of life? Where would they hear about Christ? And so we are indispensable. But there's another fact about salt that's very important, and that it was was used in the ancient Near East as a preservative, of course, prior to the modern era of modern refrigeration. And so people had to use it to preserve their food. Well, you and I are also called as believers to be a preserving agent in our culture. Again, how else are people going to hear the word of God unless it is through us? Now, one more thing I want to point out is notice here, Jesus, I think, gives us a clue as to what he means by calling us salt. Notice he says, you are the salt of the earth, but if that salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? Does everyone see in the underline the term tasteless? It was really strange when I read this. I've never studied it in the Greek before until now, this particular passage. The term for tasteless there actually comes from the verb morino. It's where we get our term moronic. So literally, let me read it. what Jesus is saying. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become moronic, how can it be made salty again? Now, what in the world is the connection between being foolish or moronic in salt? Well, in Hebrew, there's a term tefel, which I think serves as a double entendre. Let me explain what tefel is. Tefel, if you're to transliterate that into English, it's T-A-P-H-E-L. And that term in Hebrew has the connotation of something being tasteless, but also foolish. And so here is one instance where a Hebrew idiom connects directly with an idiom that we have in our American vernacular. Think about this. If you're at a dinner party and you claim that someone spoke a tasteless joke, what you're really saying is that it was probably offensive precisely because it was also foolish. Or maybe you might say it's foolish because it's offensive. That's precisely how tefel could be used. And I think that that may be the double entendre that Jesus is hinting at here. Now, turn your Bibles. Let me show you where this term is used, tefel, in the Old Testament. Turn your Bibles to Lamentations 2.14. Again, Lamentations 2.14. And I'm just going to read the first portion of it to show you where one instance of tefel is used. Again, Lamentations 2.14, here is Jeremiah rebuking the false prophets that Israel listened to. They listened to false prophets, which led them into idolatry, which didn't convict them of sin, but led them to sin. 
Lamentations 2.14. Jeremiah says this, he says, Your prophets have seen for you false and foolish visions. Stop there. Notice the term foolish, tefel. Precisely why were they foolish? Because they were leading the people to do that which is tasteless or immoral. That's the sort of idea that I think Jesus is driving at. So putting this together, I think the idea is that if you and I become moronic or foolish in our doctrine or our deeds, we're no different than the world. And therefore, we're good for nothing. We're not good for anything. We're no longer salt if we think like the world and we act like the world in a foolish way. We no longer have our distinctive. In fact, notice he says, notice I'll point it out. He says, how can it be made salty again? You know, that's kind of a curious thing. We read that as Christians and it's kind of like, well, wait a minute. That's like saying if salt is no longer salty, it's like saying water isn't wet. How many here have ever been around water that isn't wet? It seems like an absurdity. But remember, in Israel, they weren't pouring out pure salt like sodium chloride like you and I are out of our salt shaker. No, they got their salt from around the Dead Sea, which was a composite. Yes, it had salt in it, but there was a lot of other minerals and extras, you might say, in it. So the idea is once the salt was washed away, that compound was worthless, and the people would just throw it out. If you and I become moronic and foolish as the world in our doctrine and our deed, we might as well just be thrown out because we're worthless. That's what Jesus is saying. And so this call to be salt in our culture is a call to be distinct in our doctrine and our deed. That's what Jesus is calling us to. Now, I want to relate this specifically to our culture for just a moment and talk about a particular issue that I see happening. But as I do that, I want you to realize that the problem I'm about to allude to is really the same battle or part of the same battle that's been going on from the very beginning. Remember all the way back in the garden, Bob mentioned this in Sunday school, what was the original sin of Adam and Eve in the garden? That they would be like God knowing the difference between good and evil. And you see that today. And you see it really in every generation. But fast forward in the book of Genesis to Genesis chapter 11. What did the world do? They built a one world order as they all came together with a one government and a global system that God ended up having to thwart and throw down. You see that today. There is a desire for global governance once again. And so the ideas are always the same. Man wants to build their own kingdom. They think they're going to evolve to perfection. But you and I are called by Christ to be salt. Christ wants his people to be salt as a preserving agent in a decaying world. Our message is not that the world is getting better, is that it's in decay, the law of entropy is true, it's getting worse, and it's heading towards judgment. But I want you to contrast that with what the world believes today. Many pagans believe that the world is evolving to perfection and that Christians are simply impeding the progress. Think about Hegel. Bob has talked a lot about this. Hegel believed in spiritual evolution, that God was drawing all things into himself. And one thing that was interesting I just learned about a year ago about Hegel is that he believed that the final expression of God in the world as he drew all things into himself, was the state. Government uber alles, government above all. That's the final expression. And so Marx took that and he materialized it. And so from taking from the haves and giving to the have-nots, they are going to progress. That's why they call themselves the progressives in our culture. They believe that they're progressing towards a utopia. One day, all of the workers of the world will unite, as it says in the Communist Manifesto. That's their dream. And they're going to bring about perfection. So all of a sudden, you and I are tipping over their punch bowl. You and I, as Christians, are saying, no, the world is heading in decay towards judgment. They're saying, no, it's progressing towards a utopian future. And can you see, therefore, that this conflict leads to the persecution of the saints. We have a completely different message. Brothers and sisters, you and I, if we don't warn the world about the impending judgment, the wrath of Christ that will come upon them, 
where else are they going to hear it? So we are called to be salt, a distinct preserving agent, precisely because they believe the wrong things. Think about this. How many in here have ever heard of the conservative insurance company? No, but you do hear the progressive one. It's the false doctrine of the age. And I don't want to get into numbers. I don't know how many people really believe in progressivism or not, but just think about that. There's the progressive group, but there isn't the conservative group. And it shows you the dominant demonic doctrine of the age is precisely that view. It's, it's so codified in our thinking that you have insurance companies named after it. It's not offensive. I, I would say that not many people would probably get the conservative insurance plan. Okay, now, we move from that call to be salt as a distinctive to the call to be light, still a distinctive, yet the idea is more nuanced that we should not be hidden. There's a, a tinge of nuance, I think, to this. Matthew 5, 14 through 16, he continues. He says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that he may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now, I want to mention something that's a little bit of a pet peeve, but let me unload on you. I think you might learn something from this. Notice that you here, Jesus is using, is a second person plural, humais. So he is addressing the corporate body of disciples that would have been on the mountain with him as he is teaching. Now, from this, many scholars today claim that the only way to be light is that when we gather together corporately as the body of Christ, as the church. But I want want you to realize that that's reading too much into this. Yes, I'm not denigrating the importance of gathering together and the importance of the corporate body of Christ. But we also, as a church corporately, are made up of individuals. And the individual is important as well. So don't think that you can just throw this away and say, yeah, I'll be a light or salt when I'm together with my brothers and sisters, but in my daily life, I'll live any way I want. No, it's an individual call, and individual believers make up the corporate body. That's how we should understand it. Now, notice he talks about we are the light of the world. What's behind this metaphor? Let me explain. First of all, the world. The world isn't simply, the term cosmos here, isn't simply the terra firma, the land and the sky and all that we see, but rather It is the arena of unbelievers who stand in opposition and in moral rebellion against God. And the precise reason why the world is depicted as being in darkness is because they don't have messianic salvation. Anyone who does not have faith in Jesus Christ is depicted in Scripture as living in darkness. In fact, one chapter earlier, remember in Matthew 4, 16, Jesus takes his headquarters of his ministry He moves it to Galilee, and it fulfilled that passage that you see in Isaiah 9, 1 through 2, where it says, the land of Naphtali and Zebulun, those who sat in darkness have seen a great light. Who were sitting in darkness? Those who didn't know messianic salvation. And so Jesus is the light that dispels the darkness of evil, the darkness of unbelief, of sin, death, and hell. And so this is why, for example, in Isaiah 42, he's going to be a light to the nations. You see the same idea in Isaiah 49. But Jesus ends up ascending into the heavens. He's seated at the right hand of God, fulfilling Psalm 110.1. And so you and I, therefore, are the delegated reflectors of his light. Or maybe another way of saying it is you and I are deputized light bearers on his behalf. We are that light. That's the idea. Now, notice here his point about the city on the hill is when you look at a city that's lit in the darkness, it really stands out. I can't tell you how many times I was flying in my life. I have over 7,000 hours of flight time, and I'd be flying over some barren area, and all of a sudden you'd look. In the middle of the night, there's this, this town, and all of a sudden you just see the light. It just stands out. It dispels the darkness. And the idea then is that you and I can't take the light that we are and hide it. And so that's precisely the point with the next illustration where he says, no one takes a lamp and puts it under a basket. You don't take the light in the room and hide it. You let the light expose 
and give light to the whole room. In the same way, brothers and sisters, you and I can end up hiding our light or even extinguishing it by doing two things. Again, in both doctrine and deed, if you and I think and act like the world, we have an extinguished light. The unbelievers won't see it. But if you and I all of a sudden become a bunch of monks and hold up in a monastery, we're precisely hiding our light. We're doing precisely what Jesus has forbidden. You see, going to the monastery isn't godly. It's sinful against what Christ has commanded. We're called to not be hidden light, but to be the light that exposes the deeds of darkness and gives the remedy, the gospel, salvation through Christ alone. That's what we're called to be. In fact, notice Jesus says here in verse 16, he says, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. What good works are we called to? Remember, in John 6, 29, the first work that we must do is believe in the one that he has sent. And so we are the confessors of Christ. We are those who proclaim Christ, but we also live a moral life. And the claim is, by Christ himself, as the unregenerate world see these good works, they may glorify our Father in heaven. Now, when it comes to glorifying our Father in heaven because they see our good deeds, does that mean that every single unregenerate person who hears the gospel and who sees our good actions, they're going to come to faith in Christ? I don't think that that's the intent. But remember, typically in the New Testament, yes, people are glorified by people repenting and coming to faith, but God will also be glorified not just by the vessels of mercy, but by the vessels of wrath. And that as the unregenerate see our good deeds and they hear the gospel, it heaps all the more culpability upon them if they don't repent and believe. And so at at the end of the day, either way, God will be glorified either by the vessels of mercy or the vessels of wrath. Now, I want you to talk about two different ways that we can fail to be light in our world. I want everyone to kind of see what this metaphor is about. So number one, think about it this way. We cannot become monks and hide from the world or have hidden light. I remember when I was in seminary, oops, I just poked myself in the eye. (laughs) That was helpful. (laughs) Um, When I was in seminary, I, I remember we had professors who were just enamored with the desert fathers. They called them fathers. They really aren't. They were heretics. But it's these monks who would go into the monasteries and pretend to be holy. Well, let me ask you this. How can a monk who hides away in a monastery for 30 years, how is he a light? And by the way, I don't think they probably had the doctrine to be light anyway, but how would they be a light if they're never seen? How could they? So do you see the call to be a monk and to hide away in a monastery is sinful. It's rebelling against Christ's word. I saw a show about a year ago. I think it was bitter cold out, and I, was, I got enamored with the show. It's called, um, I wrote it down, Win the Wilderness, Alaska edition. And it was about a couple who, in the 1980s, they had built a remote home in the Alaskan wilderness. By, and they, hadn't, they were literally hundreds of miles from anyone else. And so they had been there for how many years? 40 years. And they're getting elderly, and so they think, you know, let's go back to society where things are a little bit easier. So they sell their home, again, in the middle of the wilderness in Alaska, hundreds of miles away from civilization. They sell the home to the British Broadcasting Corporation, and the BBC is going to turn it into a show. So what the BBC does is they take six couples from England, and the goal of the show is that the six couples are going to compete And the couple that had, the American couple that had built the Alaskan home for all those years, they're going to decide which of the six British couples have the ability to survive in the wilderness, and they're going to be the inheritors of this home. So as the show proceeds and progresses, you realize that whoever ends up getting this home is going to be in the wilderness for the next 30, 40, 50 years of their life. And I thought to myself, you know, that is a, a show that I think it would be immoral for Christians to be part of. Because it's precisely this reason that you and I are called to be the light. If I won the show, and all of a sudden me and my wife go to the wilderness, and you don't see us for 40 years, how am I going to be a light to any of the unregenerate around me? Doesn't Jesus also, through the book of Hebrews, the author, call us 
not to forsake the assembling together as some are prone to do. Brothers and sisters, I think it's okay to get away on a vacation and get away to see the beauty of God's creation. That's one thing. But it's another thing to become a hermit or a monk out in the wilderness for 40 years. How is the unregenerate world ever going to see your light? And so it's a hidden light. The second way that we can get it wrong is that we cannot become like the world. If we become like the world in our doctrine and deed, we're not light at all. That's an extinguished light. I think about so many churches that I've seen today, and I've seen their billboards, I've seen their websites, I've looked at them, and they call themselves social justice churches or social gospel churches, when in fact, all they are is Marxist churches. They're no different than the progressive pagans around them. So when it comes to the doctrines of theology and hamartiology and anthropology, all the doctrines that we have, they're no different than the world. So the Marxists divide people race, class, gender, race, class, gender, race, class, gender, so that they can gin up the haves versus the have-nots to reach their Marxist utopia. But do these churches ever teach Galatians 3.28? It addresses the issue. Race. There's no Jew nor Gentile. Class, there's no slave nor free. Gender, there's no male nor female. But what? All are one in Christ Jesus. None of that matters. What matters is you're either in Adam, you're either in darkness, you're either in your sin, you're either under the wrath of God, or you're in Christ. Those are the only two camps. And so, brothers and sisters, you and I cannot become like the world in either our doctrine or deed. And I think it's very interesting that Jesus himself prayed in his great high priestly prayer in John 17 that neither of these two things would happen to the true believer. Notice here, he's interceding really in advance for believers. Jesus prays to the heavenly father, John 17, 15. He says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. Now, notice this first one, I do not ask that you take them out of the world. That would prevent us from being a hidden light. But notice, keep them from the evil one. That's to prevent an extinguished light. Now, let me just hit this a little bit more. Notice when he says, do not take them out of the world. Some have concluded that that means the rapture will never happen. Well, no. Jesus' prayer is that during the church age, you have to have a church. Right? So there will be a rapture prior to the wrath of God coming. So, so don't buy into that. The other thing is when he says to keep them from the evil one, this doesn't mean that you and I will never sin. It means that once we've had the domain transfer from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of the beloved son, you can read about that in Colossians 1, 13 through 14, we're forever secure. Our light will not be extinguished, not because of our goodness or greatness, but because of the power and the grace of God. And that is a prayer that, in fact, yes, the Father does indeed answer. Okay, so let's come to some applications. I've got one that has three parts. And that is, being salt and light in our decaying world involves, for me, three things. Number one, proclaiming the gospel accurately and boldly. And what I mean by boldly, I mean precisely being accurate. It is a bold thing in our culture to be accurate with the gospel. Because when you're accurate with who Christ is, what he has done, why we need him, and how we receive him, the world doesn't like that. They will rebel and squirm in their seats. So that's what I mean. If we're accurate, it is in fact bold. Second, being salt and light in our decaying world involves living godly lives even while being persecuted. That's not easy. It's not easy being lied about, hated, and persecuted, and yet still loving your enemy. Number three, being salt and light in our decaying world involves being prepared to give a rational response for our hope. Each one of us is called, even despite us living in a postmodern age where they don't believe we have access to the truth, we are called to give a rational response for why we believe. And God, as I'll show you, will indeed use it. Okay, so let's begin with the first one. I think to be called salt and light in our decaying world means that we must be convinced in our own minds that the primary mission that we all have as believers in Christ 
is to confess Christ, to teach Christ, to preach Christ, to proclaim Christ, that his gospel and his word must be upon our lips. And I want to start building the case by reminding you that when Jesus ascended and he sent the Spirit, the primary role of the Holy Spirit was to bring about the confession of Christ. We see that in John 15, 26. Jesus says, when the helper comes whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth that proceeds from me, excuse me, from the Father, he will testify about me. Dear ones, notice the term testify there in the blue, martureo, means to testify or to give witness to. And so the Spirit's role is to bring about the confession of Christ. So think about if you're at a church, and I remember happening when I was a brand new Christian, there was these people, I would get, get together with them, and there was always, they were always trying to gin up a miracle. Of, did you hear about their gold fillings in people's teeth? Or did you see that there was gold dust coming out of the vents? And there was always some miraculous thing that they were seeking. But the person and work of Christ was not confessed. What's the point? If Christ isn't confessed, there's really not a work of the Spirit because that's the primary role of the Spirit is to bring about the confession of Christ. And so this is why then in 2 Timothy 4.2, the Apostle Paul doesn't give a suggestion or a helpful hint. He commands all elders, pastors, and teachers through Timothy, who was a pastor in Ephesus. He says, preach the word. Preach the word when? He says, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Now, dear ones, notice he says, preach the word when? He says, be ready in season and out of season. When I taught in this passage, I had noted that what Paul is building off of is back in the ancient Near East when Paul was writing, there were many trained rhetoricians when they would debate other people they would look for the opportune time to make a point for the audience and against their opponents so that the point would not be lost or muted. And so that's what Paul is building off of. He is saying, don't worry about the opportune time or the inopportune time, preach Christ. So if people want to hear the gospel, preach Christ. If they don't want to hear the gospel, you got it, preach Christ. If they like the Bible, preach Christ. If they don't like the Bible, preach Christ. If times are good, preach Christ. If times aren't so good, preach Christ. We're going to keep preaching Christ. That's what we're going to keep doing. Why? Because as it says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by our good deeds. No, by the word of Christ. Whenever I heard that saying, you give the gospel always, and if you have to use words, I used to think that that was wise. It's not. No, just because you have a moral person doesn't mean that the unregenerate sees that and says, that's it, I'm coming to Christ. We have to preach it. We have to have it upon our lips and know the doctrines of who he is and what he has done. Now, I want you to see that not only is the preacher required, but all those who send the preacher, that's Paul's point here, that the entire church is necessary for the proclamation of the gospel. Romans 10, 14 through 15, he says, how then will they, that would be the unregenerate, How will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Dear ones, notice in blue, the question that Paul asks is a rhetorical one which demands the answer, they won't. Yes, God uses means there needs to be a preacher. But notice right after that, how will they preach unless they are sent? The ones who send are just as essential as the one who preaches. So think of it this way. Every single one of us is called to have the gospel upon our lips. We're all preachers. But then we also have preachers and teachers who are dedicated to that ministry. But the point is, unless the church, the entirety of it, sends it and does the work, it won't happen. Let me illustrate this through a story. Years ago, I've always been involved with aviation, and I read a book about the uh, Navy fighter pilot. I don't know if anyone has ever heard of him, Randy Cunningham. He was a Vietnam ace. He shot down five Vietnamese airplanes during the Vietnam War. 
Well, and during one of his kills, he shot down a MiG-17, and he landed back at his carrier, the USS Constellation. And when he landed on the carrier, there's 5,000 guys on the carrier all celebrating, slapping each other on the back. They're just ecstatic. They shot down an airplane. Well, here there's a New York Times reporter, or some, I don't remember if it was New York Times, I thought it was, but there's a reporter on the carrier, and he goes to Randy Cunningham, the fighter pilot who shot him down. He says, hey, you and your radar intercept officer shot down the MiG. Why are all these guys cheering and applauding like they were part of it? And Randy Cunningham took exception with this reporter. He said, hey, when I got up this morning, did I fix my own breakfast? No, the cook did it. Did I fuel the airplane that I just flew to shoot down the airplane? No, the fueler did it. Did I load the missile that shot down the airplane? No, the armament person did it. And he went down the list. And at the end, he said, so you see today, 5,000 men just shot down a MiG-17. Brothers and sisters, that's the way it is for our mission. If, if you weren't there, Bob and I would just be blowing bubbles in the dark, right? Uh, maybe we'd play some other game that's more interesting, but we'd just be in the dark. There was nothing to do. And I can't tell you how necessary every single Christian is. Every Christian needs to use their gift. It's an all-hands-on-deck mission to get the gospel out. Why? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Think of it again, dear ones, if you and I are the most diligent role models in our society, and yet Christ isn't proclaimed, we have failed. The proclamation of Christ is how people are going to be saved. So we must be salt and light in that way. Now, we also have to adorn that gospel with godly living. One way to destroy the light or to become unsalty is to live in such a way that we distract from the gospel. And that's why Peter, and by the way, I'll show you on the next slide, Peter derives much of what he says right from the Sermon on the Mount in the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter 2.12, Peter says, Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. That's almost identical to what Christ said today in the Sermon on the Mount. One thing I want to point out, notice, curiously, Peter says, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Why does he say that? Here, Peter, speaking to Christians in Asia Minor, he's speaking primarily to Gentiles. So here's the analogy. Just as Israel was to be a light to the nations, you and I as believers are like Israel to be a light to the pagans or the nations as well. Now, don't take from that, as some have, the doctrine of replacement theology, that somehow the church is Israel. No, there is still a plan for national ethnic Israel. But the analogy is that you and I are called to be light among the pagan world. And so, in fact, he says that our good deeds, if they see them, they will glorify God in the day of visitation. The term visitation there comes from episcopate. It's where we get our term for episcopal. It means to visit. And oftentimes in the Old Testament, when God would visit his people, when he would visit them, it would either lead to judgment or it would lead to salvation, depending upon the response. And so the idea, again, is that those who don't come to the gospel, they don't come to faith, but they see our good deeds, there's further culpability heaped upon them, and they're still going to glorify God in the day of judgment. But by God's grace, if some do turn, to forgiveness through faith in Christ, they, in fact, are going to glorify God also in the day of visitation. Again, God is going to be glorified by both the vessels of mercy and the vessels of wrath. Dear ones, what Peter is saying is not that you and I give the gospel simply by living a good life, but rather our godly living is that which adorns the gospel. And so let me ask you today, between you and the Lord, are there areas in your life, truth be told, that you're not adorning the gospel, that you're living in such a way that it distracts from the gospel? You see, the idea is when we go proclaim the gospel, the gospel is offensive to the unregenerate world. What we want to do is limit any offense that we have in our own life 
so that the only offense that causes one to stumble is the offense of the gospel. Let it be between, let it be between the sinner and God when the stumbling occurs, not between us, the Lord, and the sinner. Let's remove ourselves. If we live godly lives and blameless, then the stumbling block is simply the gospel. That's what Peter is driving at. And so we're also, by this same Peter, I'll come to my third point now, is he also moves on in the very next chapter of 1 Peter 3 to call us to give a rational defense. You and I are called to give a rational defense for what we believe to the pagan world. And in that way, we're also called to be salt and light. Listen to what he says, 1 Peter 3, 14 through 15. He says, but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed and do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. First thing I want to point out, notice verse 14 when he says, even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. That comes precisely from the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes that Christ has just taught. Why does Peter know that? Because he's was, he was with Christ. He's repeating what Christ said. But notice here in verse 15, we have two parts to our apologetic task. And by the way, when I talk about apologetics, I'm not saying we're apologizing, just saying we're sorry, but giving a rational defense. Notice the first part of the apologetic task is to sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Now, the first thing I want to define is what does he mean by heart? Does he mean simply the organ that pumps blood? No, he's using it as a metaphor. Again, the heart is often seen as the center of our thought life. And so the idea is with our will, our emotions, and our intellect, the center of our mind, we have to sanctify, which means set apart Christ as Lord. And so what that means is that you and I are concerned that he is the Lord, and therefore we're going to fear him and want to please him. If we don't get that right beforehand, we'll go into the public arena wanting to please man because we've made them Lord. And therefore, you and I won't be faithful to the doctrines and the deeds that we are called to. The first part of the apologetic task is defining the one that you want to serve and please. That's number one. But number two, notice the always, not sometimes, not when you feel like it, not when you're, it's always being ready to make a defense. The term defense there, apologia, means a rational, cogent defense where you and I know the truth and therefore we can also dispel and explain the air. You and I have to be so familiar with the doctrines of Christ, who he is, what he has done, that you and I can spot the air a mile away. If the Jehovah Witness comes to your door, they have a different Christ than you do. Their Christ is not God, and yet they call themselves Christian. Can any old Christ save? Doesn't Paul warn in 2 Corinthians 11 about a different gospel, a different Christ, and a different spirit? He does. And so our task in this culture is to say, no, that's not the doctrines of Christ. This is, and lovingly do it. And that brings me to the final point. Notice he says that when we give this rational defense, we're to do it with what? Notice in the bottom, gentleness and reverence. And what that means is that if you and I are ornery or angry, it doesn't add one thing to the argument. What we're simply to do is to give the truth and love and let God do the rest. In James 1.20, James says that the wrath of man, the anger of man, does not bring about the righteousness of God. So our anger will do no good. What does good is that we lovingly give the gospel. That's what we're called to do. Now, I want to talk about our postmodern era for just a moment before we go out the door. I know I've talked to Christians over the last 10 years who oftentimes despair about going into a postmodern world that claims that no one has access to truth and then to rationally argue for the truth. But dear ones, I'm going to show you that we are to do it anyway. It's interesting that sometimes unbelievers are likened to those who don't reason. In fact, I'm going to show you here in Jude 1.10, Jude was dealing with false teachers that he describes as unreasoning beasts. 
Jude 1.10, he says, but these men revile the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct like unreasoning animals. By these things, they are destroyed. Jude was rebuking men who had no knowledge of what was going on in the angelic realm, and yet they bossed angels around. And you hear that today. People will be on a prayer walk, prayer walk and they'll say, I bind you, Satan. I bind this demon. I bind that. They're reviling majestic majesties because God alone has the authority to do with his angels and his demons what he pleases. So in that sense, these false teachers were like what? Unreasoning beasts. They weren't functioning by the rational cognitive mind, but just like an animal by instinct. And so it is, it seems, those in the postmodern culture. But I want to assure you that God created all people in his image. And as his image bearers of God, God created man to be rational beings. If you go out even to the postmodern world, they will still stop their car at a red light and they will go at a green light. Postmodernity and becoming irrational only happens when it comes to religion. They come to church and they say, well, all of a sudden I can't know. So here's the point. Don't buy the irrationality. The real reason why people don't want to believe the gospel is not because they can't understand rationally what you're saying, as if you and I are speaking Chinese to those who only understand English. It's not that. The truth be told, the reason why the unregenerate, the pagans around us, don't want to hear the gospel is because they love their sin. That's the ultimate reason. So says Jesus in John 3.19. He says, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world. Again, stop there. Jesus is the light. He's come into the world. He says, and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. Brothers and sisters, the reason why people don't want the gospel is because it makes them change. It'll make them flee from the sins that so easily entangle them, and they'll have to change and follow the lordship of Christ. What's the original sin in the garden? That you will be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. The, the false teachers in the unregenerate world, they like that. So brothers and sisters, take heed. Keep giving a rational defense for the gospel. God will use it, and God will regenerate those who belong to him. Three things I want to leave you with. I wrote them down so I won't forget them. Succinctly, to be salt and light, give the gospel accurately, adorn it with godly living, don't join a monastery. Let's be salt and light in our world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you that by your grace and mercy, you've called us out of the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of your beloved Son. We pray, Lord, that we would be good reflectors of your light and your glory in both our doctrine and our deed. We do pray, Lord, that if there are areas in our life that we need to change, that you would enable us by your power and your spirit to do so, so that we would not detract from the gospel. And Lord, we pray that you would regenerate hearts before us and give us this summer, as we're at cookouts and uh, friends with friends and family and neighbors across the fence, that you would give us ample opportunity to be bold and to give accurately your word so that others may be saved and, the, and be spared from the coming wrath. We pray that you would do that for us, all for the sake of your great name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, please stand, if you will, for the benediction. Jude 24 and 25. It says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in his presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. God bless all of you. Have a wonderful week.